if, if cap rates go up by 50, 100 basis points above that, you know, whatever the number may be, wh where is that break even exit cap rate? And then you're looking at the debt, right? That's usually what dictates the duration of a deal, oftentimes. Um, and so you want to be able to weather a storm and keep holding and continuing to cash flow. And so those are a lot of the, the variables that we're constantly looking at, Sam. I think it's uh, prudent to be able to, to run the numbers a lot of different ways and, and stress test the deal. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Mark Curry has been an avid real estate investor for the last 17 years, and throughout his career, he's been involved in residential and commercial investments throughout multiple markets in the U.S. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sam. Good to be back. Absolutely. The pleasure is mine. Mark, I know you've been on the show before, but just for listeners that maybe didn't catch that last episode, can you tell me in 90 seconds or less, where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Sure. Yeah. Started as a financial analyst working in corporate America for a number of years. Lots of spreadsheets, analysis, budgets, planning. Moved over to a operations role and a different company. Those two kind of meshed well with real estate investing. Started investing on the side, Sam, like a lot of people do. After work, going to Home Depot, renovating, house hacking, you name it. Um, that was all pre-2008 recession. And then uh, we started seeing a lot of discounts in the market, investing predominantly in foreclosures, REOs, short sales, uh, all cash buys, that kind of thing. And then fast forward, we wanted to expand and diversify into commercial real estate. Uh, we did that, you know, started about 12, 13 years ago in, in that space. And now today, where are we at? We like to focus on affordable housing. It's kind of our biggest investment um, strategy asset class, mobile home parks, apartments, self-storage, a lot of res recession resistance, Sam. That's our, our focus today. So we've evolved. We're a private equity group. We raise capital from our investor group and um, uh, invest in larger commercial institutional quality investments. I love it. That's a lot of moving pieces there in, in what seems like probably a very short period of time. I do want to focus in on, you, you mentioned affordable housing, and that sounds like that's part of a key part of your strategy right now. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'll expand a bit on that term because it can be used a few different ways. But uh, essentially, you know, in the mobile home park space, for example, we're providing housing, which is usually the, the, the least, uh, the lowest cost, right? The most affordable option. Um, we believe in that as a long term trend and thread where, where we can uh, have a, a consistent growing demand for that product. Um, and then also in apartments, you know, we're typically looking, Sam, at um, growth markets where there's a lot of data and numbers showing uh, long-term trends, um, South, Southeast, Texas, et cetera. Love those markets. But we're looking for apartment buildings, Sam, that are usually um, well afforded by the local area median income. And so there's a formula there. There's a way to do the math and making sure that the local population can afford the rents. And that's that's a big part of our focus today. How how do you find an existing complex and keep it in the affordable affordable range and yet still provide returns to your investors and to yourself? Yeah. So, uh, well, as far as finding goes, almost all of our deals come to us from relationships that we have in the industry. They're usually private, uh, sometimes off market. Hey, Mark, we got a live one. Are you and your company or family interested in... in co-investing with us, partnering with us, that kind of thing for the, the equity in the deal. And so we're always looking at deals, Sam, usually 10 to 20 a month. We invest in about five to seven a year, give or take. And so wow. it's just a filtration process. Um, we know exactly what we're looking for. It's hard to find, but when we find it, we're ready to go, right? So as far as the affordability portion goes, um, our latest deal in Houston, for example, is a, a 215 unit building, Sam. It's 99% uh, uh, occupied. Mm. Uh, what we're going to do once we acquire it next week, we're scheduled to close. Uh, we're going to keep 50% of the units affordable. And so that means we're going to actually lower the rents over the period of about a year and allow for um, people in the community to be able to afford that unit, right? And, and the other half will stay at market rate. 
And so there's a, a very specific strategy here, Sam, where we can increase the affordable housing in the local region and um, also you know, do well as investors. And that, that portion comes a lot from uh, this strategy where there's a property tax exemption. Mm. And so the property for, you know, in return for keeping half the units affordable, we get a uh, exemption on property taxes. And so that reduces our expenses as we hold the asset and then creates a, a very attractive return for investors while also, of course, increasing affordable housing, which is much needed in the region. Is a, when you get that property tax exemption, is that a dollar for dollar typically exchange as you underwrite it? Where you're like, okay, hey, we're gonna we're gonna reduce rents, which is I just haven't met anybody else I think on the show that said one well, part of our plan is to lower rents once we acquire an asset. Kind of funny, but once you once you once you lower those rents, let's use an example, say a hundred bucks a month, are you then able to exactly set that off by or offset that by? The dollars that you're saving on the property tax exemptions and if so how do you how do you ensure that you get that kind of uh, process to work before you close sure yeah uh so it's not dollar for dollar there's usually a benefit to us as the owner and investor um and so to put it in, in perspective i'll give you an example like the latest deal we're projecting to lower the rents by about two hundred seventeen thousand dollars annually wow. And uh, we're going to have about a million dollars in tax savings. Wow. So the, it offsets it and it creates positive cash flow. It reduces our expenses pretty significantly, Sam, which is obviously uh, reducing risk. Um, and so that's that's usually the offset. That's not always that simple. There's a lot of moving parts here. It's a partnership with the housing authority. Um, in the local region. And so there's a lot of uh, legal paperwork, documents, um, structure, and then, of course, uh, getting the tax exemption to be approved prior to closing. How do you, how, when you, I mean, getting to the point where you have accepted offers, you know, all those things, putting, putting you know, earnest money down, it seems like this would be part of the equation that you'd really want to have firmed up before you get to that stage. Is that the case or is this kind of a one, it just when it happens, it happens in the process, I guess. Now you, you got you got to know what you're doing. Well, well said. So, yeah, uh, yeah this is a, a process for us where we um, we're partnering with an operating partner, Sam, which is our business model, where we source and, and identify and partner with other investment groups that are specialists in one thing. Right. Um, get to know them, like them, trust them, invest with them, um, and then we we get access to these kinds of deals. And so they are experts in this space. This is where they focus daily. Um, they have you know, 65 staff, at just their headquarters, several hundred more across the properties, large firm, a few billion of assets under management. And so that, that type of pedigree, uh, Sam, comes with these types of, I, I call it more unique, uh, my favorable for creating a win-win type of investment. Um, and they they're experts at the process and the structure They've done it many times before. And so we come in we, we underwrite, we evaluate, we ask a ton of questions. We structure the deal from an equity perspective as well internally um, where we can go out to our investor group and say, Hey, we really like this deal. Here's why, here's how we're going to do it. And here's how you can participate if you're interested. And so that, that's kind of how it all works. But from the acquisition standpoint, like, yeah, a condition of closing is to make sure that this is all signed and agreed on prior to reclosing on the property. Right, right. No, I love that. I love that. That's a very, it's a unique strategy in a way to add value to a property, you know, that uh, probably not everyone, actually everyone's not employing. So I love, uh, I love the thought process there. Is there a particular type of apartment complex that you have to do this in? Or is it you can take anything and do it? Like what's the what's the buy box look like on the asset? Yeah, uh, well, there's a couple of ways to kind of decipher how and where to do this, right, Sam? So we like Texas. There's a pretty high property tax um, rate there, the millage rate, you know, two and a half, three percent, whatever it right. might be. Yay. They also reassess regularly. And so you have a high likelihood of property taxes going up. Um, and so that's a favorable environment. Uh, but you also have uh, kind of the, the regulatory environment there, too. With the counties and municipalities, all, all not all, but many of them being on board, understanding this type of structure and providing it. And so if you go and compare that to 
you know, other states that maybe have much lower property taxes um, or aren't open to this idea, it's going to be very hard to do. So location is uh, um, relatively, I don't want to say fixed. There's other, other areas where it could work too. But we're focusing predominantly in, in Texas on this. Um, and so that's kind of how we're looking at it, how we're doing it. I don't know if there was another part of your question, Sam, but feel free to chime in again. And mm-hmm. I, I think you've answered it well. Okay. Let's, uh, l- let's shift gears here a little bit. I love, thanks for taking the time to break down your guys' affordable housing strategy. We didn't talk much about mobile home parks, uh, but I do want to make sure that if, if we have time, we will come back to that. But I'd love to hear what else you guys are doing. I know that it sounds like the affordable housing component is part of you're kind of pivoting with the market, but let's talk about what you guys are doing strategically right now to pivot with the market, where we are in these market conditions. I mean, just kind of give us what yeah. see and how you guys are, are approaching uh, things right now. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll share maybe a little, little evolution. I'll make, keep it quick, but you know, we pivoted, we've pivoted several times, Sam, over mm-hmm. the last call it, 10, 12 years um, with the markets Um First pivot for us was like 2017-ish. We really stopped investing in single family, small multifamily, Sam, um, and focused uh, all of our effort in commercial institutional quality housing. Mm. Um, And we did that for a number of reasons, but predominantly at that time, we just saw less margin, uh, a lot of competition. We saw um, less uh, deeply discounted properties and that kind of window of opportunity Post recession was was closing to say the least. Yeah. Um, so we pivoted there. And then 2018, we started to think and see some indicators that there could be a recession soon, and so we pivoted again and just decided to focus on recession resistance as an investment strategy. In 2019, we created a recession resistant fund. We combined mobile home parks, um, apartment communities, and self storage into one investment vehicle. We invested across, I want to say about nine or so different opportunities, Sam, Mm. Um, a little over 12,000 units in the fund, 13 states, really spreading out capital. And the purpose of that investment vehicle was to kind of hold everything for five to 10 years, right? And and weather a storm should one come, continue to cash flow, um, and hopefully retain asset value through a potential downturn. So that was a big pivot. Um, 2020, COVID came, we stopped investing for seven months. We didn't make any new investments on purpose. We Mm -hmm. watched, we waited, we analyzed tons of data internally, externally, macro, you name it, trying to figure out what's going on. Number one, number two, are tenants going to stay in pay? Is there going to be distress? Really trying to to realize uh, where things might be going. And so that was a pivot just to say no to a lot of opportunities for a number of months. In, t- in late 2020, we started realizing, Sam, just by looking at the data and the, the metrics, that there's a high demand for affordable housing and for right. apartments and mobile home parks, and not just from residents, but also from investor groups who we typically sell to, right? So, we're watching our exit um, and is the demand for our product going up or down. We saw pretty favorable trends at that point, Sam. There was rapid rent growth, it was cap rate compression. And we started investing in shorter term deals, call it one to three year holds on purpose. We were coming in and basically with a, a reputable operating partner to fix and flip a lot of multifamily properties. And so we added that to our portfolio. We did a number of those deals and then we pivoted again in Q1 of 2022, stopped doing short term deals. Now we're focusing again back on recession resistance. We have been, right? We're recording this in October. 2022, and we continue to be um, focusing on cash flowing investments, long term fixed rate debt. Um, really, just trying to make sure that we can underwrite smartly and weather the obviously uh, uh, the impact of the Fed's fight against inflation by raising interest rates, um, you know, very quickly and rapidly. And so, this is how we're pivoting. We're continuously looking at deals today and uh, being even more selective than before. Sam, I think. Uh, you know, debt is top of mind. We're still seeing very strong fundamentals. I'm sure you probably are too, meaning demand for apartments and affordable housing keeps going up. Rental rates are still growing in many markets, not as fast as they used to. You don't underwrite to that, but the fundamentals are there. Occupancy rates are very high. 
and we're still seeing uh, uh, attractive metrics to keep investing, but we're just being smarter and safer. When you when you say that you're investing more for cash flow, which I think is supposed to be in theory, everyone's like number one rule, right? And we invest for cash flow, which I, I've heard that said a lot. I don't believe it. Once I see a lot of the projections that come out, you see the shiny brochure and you're like, wait, this thing's heavily weighted in the appreciation category. Uh, but thanks for sending it over. Uh, but but how do you, as a cash flow investor, I guess w- when you bring that to your investor group and you say, hey, because I know obviously a lot of people listening to this show, raise capital. Uh, and so when you bring it to your group, how do you underwrite it in such a way that it becomes still a compelling investment? And yet, if you're positioning yourself only to really clip the coupon, I guess, can you, does my question even make sense or am I just wandering here? No, you're good. You're good. So a couple of things come to mind, you know, as far as underwriting goes, um, you know, everyone says, uh, likes to say that, oh, it's conservatively underwritten. It's so conservative. Yeah. Right. If it was too conservative, you would never invest by the way. So it's <laughs> always some type of uh, assumption being built in that you hope will come true. Right. And so how do we look at that? I mean, I won't, won't go too deep into the details in lieu of time, but we're obviously analyzing rent comps. We're analyzing sales comps. We want to make sure that our basis is very attractive and that we're getting a really good deal for some reason, whatever that reason may be, right? There's usually right. a story behind every deal. Um, and as far as rent comps, you know, what's the rent growth projection, right? Sam, this is a big one for us, has been for a number of years because rents have gone through the roof. We don't expect that to continue. Um, and so you have to look at those numbers and stress test them. That's the other big part of it. We stress test everything. And so we'll even look and see like, hey, what's break even occupancy? And assuming we get to that point and then are able to come back from it from a few after a few years, and there's some catastrophic event, whatever it might be, how does that effectuate the return? Um, exit cap rates, a very big one. We've been uh, underwriting exit cap rate growth for many years on our deals. And uh, that's anywhere from call it 75 to 200 basis points, depending on how we want to uh, underwrite that, what we're buying it at, et cetera. And so then we'll stress test that too. Hey, if, if cap rates go up by 50, 100 basis points above that, you know, whatever the number may be, wh- where is that break even exit cap rate? And then you're looking at the debt, right? That's usually what dictates the duration of a deal oftentimes. Um, and so you want to be able to weather a storm and keep holding and continuing to cash flow. And so those are a lot of the, the variables that we're constantly looking at, Sam. I think it's uh prudent to be able to to run the numbers a lot of different ways and, and stress test the deal. Absolutely. No, I like that. I absolutely like that. If you re- rewound, if I could rewound, rewind, I don't know, Mark, rewind the last 17 years. What is one thing you feel like you've done really well that other investors and or uh, active deal sponsors should emulate? Yeah, I think, well, I'm just thinking if, if it's a deal level. So, it's, it's probably going to go back to maybe one of our first conversations together, Sam, is working with the right people, I'd say, the best the best of the best, and making sure you're creating a win-win. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, like we're, we're, we're in the partnership business, right? And so we rely on our operating partners to source and execute on the business plan of the properties. We're also relying on our investors to uh, partner with us and 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 invest with us. And so uh, it has to win. It has to be a win-win for both sides of the equation, right? So if we're going to be responsible for investing into a deal, our operating partner is relying on us to be there for the entire portion of that investment up front, in the middle, the back end, right? Sometimes we have consent rights. Sometimes we're you know, co-GPing, whatever the, the deal may be. And so it's a traditional partnership. And the same with our investors, right? They are expecting us to be able to execute on the business plan and provide them with the the, the returns that we said we were going to, right? Do as you say. And so uh, there has to be a win-win there where everyone is uh, benefiting from the structure and the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If there's one thing that you could do over and or a, a mistake you can help our investors avoid altogether, Anything come to mind? Yeah, I would say right now, just be patient. It's mm. very hard to do, right? We're, we're all trying to grow and create wealth and uh, create passive income. Um, you don't want to make a mistake, right? Warren Buffett's number rule, number one rule is uh, don't lose money and 
Right. Number two is don't forget rule number one, right? So, you know, that, that just keeps coming top of mind right now. And things are so volatile, Sam, we don't know where things are going. And so be patient, try and find opportunities where you, you know, the old hell yeah adage, right? When you're, you're done looking at it, you say, wow, how can I not invest in this, right? Instead of this could work. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's sound advice. I think for the times right now, the uh, the gut level. Yeah, this is a great investment versus this could work. Uh, those are two very different outcomes uh, when you're reviewing a deal. So that's uh, that's fantastic, Mark. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. It's certainly certainly a pleasure to have you back on. I loved hearing your thoughts on affordable housing, how you guys are finding opportunities inside of that, the unique strategy you're using with getting tax uh, tax exemptions, uh, the way you guys are partnering, the way you've the way you've pivoted, the way you hit pause in 2020. That's hard to do, especially you know when you guys I'm sure have a have a larger team. You got many mouths to feed. And uh, hitting the stop button and or pause button is uh, that's a discipline. So certainly appreciate you sharing with sharing with us here today. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, Mark, what is the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, my, my uh, email, you can email me anytime. It just go to info at smkcap.com. Our company name again is SMK Capital Management. And our website um, has tons of information, some investment opportunities, examples, that's smkcap.com. Wonderful. Mark, thank you again, sir. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Sam.